How do you create an extraordinary quality of life today? For nearly two decades, this one man, Anthony Robbins, has searched for and found that answer. Now, using education to teach and entertainment to inspire, his systems for change empower millions around the world to improve their lives. Live, by satellite, on audio tape across 42 nations, from Russia to Germany, England to China, his impact is global. Oh, yay. Sun, sun, Tony sun, Robbins out. is sought out as a peak performance consultant and turnaround expert. He has met with world leaders like Nelson Mandela and yeah. consulted with Mikhail Gorbachev. He has counseled U.S. President Clinton and Princess Diana. Tony Robbins provides the competitive edge in sports. He strategized with America Cubed, which brought home the America's Cup. He helped the L.A. Kings reach the Stanley Cup Finals for the first time in 17 years. Then, when Andre Agassi was ranked 30th, he asked Tony Robbins to help improve his mental focus. Within six months, Agassi won the U.S. Open and became the number one player in the world. Tony Robbins has worked with people from every walk of life, from the most challenged to the most successful. From people like Quincy Jones, Pamela Lee, Bill Farley, and executives from Fortune 500 companies. From the very famous to the very special. Now, Tony Robbins can be your personal coach with his 30-day personal power system. Learn how to master your emotions. I'm happier today than I've ever been before in my life. Your physical health. I've maintained a 78-pound weight loss for two years. Your relationships. I'm so much in love. Your finances. From zero in sales to $7 million in revenue. And balance your life. He's saying, here's the door, here's the key. Go for it. Personal Power is the number one best-selling personal achievement system of all time with over 25 million educational cassettes sold. Coming up, we'll travel to the Big Island of Hawaii where each year more than 1,000 people from 42 nations attend his most exclusive event, Mastery University, to learn a tool you can use to immediately improve any area of your life. Welcome to Anthony Robbins Life Management Systems. Now let's join Tony at his beautiful island resort in Fiji. Hi, I'm Tony Robbins, and welcome to our Fijian island resort, Namale. It's a paradise here, and we're about to go on a journey together that will include some time here in Fiji, some time in Hawaii at my master university, and maybe a couple other places where I can share with you just a couple of tools that can help you increase the quality of your life. In just 45 minutes, we can't obviously give you a whole seminar because one little section is three or four hours, but I want to give you a little appetizer or two of some tools that can help you to, one, increase the quality of your communication. Because my personal belief is it doesn't matter what your goals are, your desires, ultimately your ability to achieve them and to be happy and to be fulfilled comes down to communication. And we all communicate well when we're in an unstressed state. But when we get stressed, we start developing patterns that stop us. So I want to make sure that in order to have that quality of life where you can really manage your life effectively, you learn just a couple of tools in that area. Secondly, if we're going to manage our life and really learn life management systems, we have to know our priorities. So we're going to do a little goal setting workshop. And you may have begun a part of that if you've already gone through the audio tapes of Personal Power, which I hope you've done, because that's ideal to go through before you go through this videotape. But if you haven't, you can do it here with me on the videotape together. And I can tell you that this little process is something that's totally changed my life and an amazing number of other people. In fact, sometimes when you begin a process, you wonder, oh, is this really going to make any difference? You know, it seems so simple. But I can tell you that simple things, little things, aren't little at all if they are significant, if they're things that can shape our lives, if they can change the way we think, the way we believe, the way we act, and therefore what we experience in our lives. And that's what we're going to share with you on this tape. So again, you'll get a little peek of many different things, but I hope you'll take the time to not only watch passively, but to actively do some of the exercises. Because I can make a tape that just looks really fine, but instead I want to do something that you actually do. It's kind of like a live video workbook. So don't sit passively, do something, follow through, and I can promise you some amazing results. Especially if you've really gone through personal power now for the 30 days. I can give you an idea, in the last week, I get to hear stories every day from people that have used personal power and made huge changes or use portions of it even. In the last week, I had the privilege of 
visiting with a man who I met about a year ago, right after the President's State of the Union address. I kind of stayed in the background until a little after midnight, and I decided to walk up the steps of the Capitol and stand there where the President is inaugurated and just see what it felt like up there for the person who was really making a difference in our country. And in the middle of the night, I see this man running up these stairs saying, are you Anthony Robbins? And I said, yes. And he reached up and he grabbed my hand and he shook it. And he said, my name is Bobby Rush. He said, you know something? I'm a congressman today because of you. I said, you're kidding. And he said, no. And he shared with me how he went through personal power and he changed some of his most limiting beliefs. And he said at the time, he said he knew it was valuable, but he had no idea the cumulative effect that it was going to happen for him, that he started developing a new momentum. He set some brand new goals. He made some tough decisions. He broke through what would stop him. And now he's doing something that he really loves. And by the way, he said, by the way, I was an ex-Black Panther. Talk about a little change. Simultaneously this last week, I had the privilege of spending some time that reminded me of my goal-setting workshop. This workshop you're going through, I did for myself for the first time years ago in Russia, back in 1982. And a couple days ago, I got a chance to see how the world has changed by visiting with the president of the past Soviet Union, Mr. Gorbachev, and flying with him on my private plane for four hours. Talk about chills, thinking about what can happen by using these tools. And we started talking about what changed the world. And the interesting thing that he shared with me is he said, the breakthrough, what took us from a place where we had 70,000 nuclear missiles pointing at each other, where people are constantly worrying if we're going to die or not, someone's going to push a button, people are practicing duck and cover. What wiped that out, what ended the Cold War, was two people communicating. He said, what broke it all down is I knew Americans were beasts and you knew we were horrible. He said, but Ronald Reagan and I developed a relationship. And I tried to dig, I said, when did it happen? He said, well, at our first meeting in Geneva. And I said, well, what really did that? What was the first trigger of trust? He said, well, you know, we were both on our side of the fence, you know, arguing for our side. And at one point, he said, Ronald Reagan reached out to me and he said, listen, this is not working, let me start fresh. My name is Ron. And he said, he reached out to shake my hand and say, may I call you Mikhail? And when he told me the story, he had this huge grin on his face. And I began to listen for four hours to all the tools that basically you're going to learn on this tape about quality communication and how it changes our lives, our businesses, our relationships, and literally how it changes the world. I'll give you one final example. Now all I'm trying to do is not to impress you, but to impress upon you that if you'll follow through and do this, some miracles can happen. And I'm giving you some famous names because hopefully that'll grab your attention and you'll think this is real. I tell you about John Smith, you might not listen. <laughs> but I'll give you one more. Michael Crichton, the writer. I was speaking with him earlier this week as well and he said, I want to tell you, one late night I was frustrated. People have been calling me saying, how's it going? Which he said really means, where's our work? Where's the screenplay? And he said, I just didn't have any momentum. And he said, I watched this show and I thought, what the heck, I'll try this. And he got the personal power tapes, he said, and he listened. He said, I did the whole thing all the way through. And he said, I knew that was important. I got this brand new momentum and this new passion, this new energy. And he said, as a result of that, he said, I started writing again. And everybody said my idea was stupid, that it had been done before, it was a waste of time. He said, but I got the thing done. And in the goal setting workshop you're about to do in a few minutes, he said, I designed what I was going to get out of that, even how much money I'd earn off this particular screenplay. And he said, I wrote down a number that was so unrealistic. It was a number that I'd never gotten before. And he said, you know what? I sold it for exactly the amount I said that I wanted. He said, so I really owe you some thanks. I said, well, what screenplay was it? What book was it? He said, Jurassic Park, <laughs> the best-selling movie of all time. He said, I guess I owe you a little thanks. I said, well, thanks, Michael. The point is, this process you're going to do is simple. I'm not going to try and pump you up. I'm going to try and give you little pieces, but it's up to you to follow through. So will you do that? Please do. Don't sit passively. Take some major action. And again, know that we're just going to give you pieces of things. At the end, we'll wrap up together. Make sure, though, that you follow through on the 30-day tapes, because this is your bonus. Those tapes are the basis of this change. And I hope as a result of these changes, you'll want to take yourself to a brand new level. So let's begin. Let's go to our first venue, and let's find out what are some of the tools that can truly change our lives. OK, good morning. Wow, good morning. Another day, a lousy day in paradise, right? <laughs> Today, we're going to do something that I'm incredibly excited about. You know, all the things we've done up until now, I know you've all felt huge transformation from. But today, when I first started thinking about it, I thought, oh, you know, this, this material is so important, but maybe I'll do just part of it because it can get digital. 
And also, we have joining us by videotape a brand new set of people who will join the 25 million people that have already been exposed to personal power. We've created Personal Power 2 now, the driving force. And in it, we're not just focused on how to achieve your goals, because as many of you know, you've become extremely successful. That's how you got here to be with me in Fiji, how you could afford to be here, both time and money-wise. But you've also learned by your own experience that that's not enough. You've got to be fulfilled. So what I want to do today is show you some tools beyond what we've done here in terms of how to really be fulfilled in your values and your goals and your life, but really how to manage your life. Because how many of you found that as you become more successful, sometimes also you've gotten more stressed? Let me see your show of hands. Say, ah! And I can tell you that all of a sudden when I got nine companies and four children and I want to write books and do television programs and now these United Artists Theaters that we do these seminars in and all these cities simultaneously and come here and do programs in Fiji, all that simultaneously while it's an incredible benefit, incredible reward, even having multiple homes, you know, a real big problem to have, right, to complain about. But all those things make a demand on your time and on your energy and your mental focus and pretty soon sometimes success starts feeling stressful. And you start achieving your goals and say, is this all there is? You know, why am I working so hard, you know? Like some people come here to Fiji and somebody says to them, you know, why are you working so hard? The Fijians will invariably ask people this. The guy says, well, I'm working hard because I want to make several million dollars so I can come here and lie on the beach. And the Fijian says, well, I lie on the beach here all the time. <laughs> I don't have any millions of dollars, right? And they have what they would call a quality of life, right? Well, so the person's, you know, so caught up in making a living, they aren't designing their life. I can promise you the impact will thrill you. By the way, let me tell you the other side, too. There's always two reasons to do things. One reason is for what you'll get. The other reason is for what you can avoid. You know? Everything we do is to avoid what? Pain and to gain some pleasure, the combination of the two. So I can tell you that if you look around just in my country, and I know we've got about seven different countries represented here, and people watching will be from countries all over the world. But in my country alone, to give you an idea, one out of every two couples who get married end up in a what? Think about that. One out of two. Was it always that way? No. What's happened is we were told that in the future, when we had all this technology and all this information, what it would do is it make our lives easier. We'd have more free time. How far has that worked? <laughs> Not very. For most people, they're working harder. They're more stressed today, even though they're living in the information age when everything's supposed to be so much easier. There's something that's shifting there, and it's because we're not managing our resources effectively enough. And that's what we want to change in this process. So part of what we're going to do here is take a look at what the cost is also if you don't do it and what you can gain. We in our country, given an idea, in America also have a situation where we've got 60 to 70% of the people who are overweight, depending upon whose poll you read. Now, how is that possible? Only one way, not managing the resources of your emotional state, of the way you eat food, of the way you move, and it costs you the quality of your life. We have 15%, or 15%, 15 million people, I should say, that every year in the United States are diagnosed as clinically depressed. 15 million. Now, how could that be? not managing the resources of your mind, your body, so you really feel good day to day. You can feel good day to day, you certainly have, but you've learned tools to do that on how to manage your state. You know, you got a situation in America where you have 5% of the world's population in the United States. We consume 50% of the world's cocaine. Think about that. All this says to me is one big giant frame. People don't know how to manage their resources. They don't know how to manage their state. They're living in a state of immense stress. This session is going to show you how to eliminate the vast majority, not all, but the vast majority of unnecessary stress in your life and put a heck of a lot more pleasure than you ever thought of before. But I think before we start, maybe what would be nice to do, since we have these people joining us by video, is let's give them a big welcome from everybody here in Fiji, from, I guess, seven different countries. Give them a big hand here. Let's welcome them here with us. Oh, give them a big welcome. Crank them up here. So, now, for these people watching the video, or the individuals watching the video, they're probably thinking, this group is crazy. They're all hyped up. They're all motivated. You know, what is this? They may just be watching this video for the first time. So I know most of you got here because some time ago, some of you years ago, some of you months ago, you were up real late one night, and you bought a set of tapes called Personal Power, and they've had a big impact on your life. That's why you came here to Fiji to expand it to another level and became part of Master University. If you were trying to tell a friend what this has meant to you, somebody who's like, oh, will this really work? I just got started. I don't know if it's going to make a difference. And it might help somebody as they're listening to think, yeah, I'm going to listen a little bit closer if I know it really works. Who here would share with them just a few seconds of what it's meant to your life? Back here, why don't you go all the way back in the corner? Yes. Donna. 
Can I have this microphone, please? Give her hand up, Donna. Well, I'm Donna Ringo. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I'm here with my husband, Bill, which I would have never imagined in a million years that this would have ever happened. So I want to thank, thank you, Tony, but it all started by thinking I had everything I had ever wanted. We had always done dreams. We had always done goals, written them down. I had a business that I had started and grew from a one-woman office to a 15 employees and sold it for over a million dollars and I thought I had everything I ever wanted and I woke up one night with nightmares crying because I was so unhappy. Just because you think you get what you want, it may not be what you really need and what you're destined to do. And I went out and watched the television. I was clicking through and I ordered the tapes and the greatest thing I ever did was listen to those tapes for every single day. I didn't miss a day. I, I, broke appointments so I could listen to Tony's tapes. And it has changed my life completely. Um, I was always happy. Everybody liked me, I thought, or whatever, but I didn't connect totally with people. And I have lost 54 pounds. I have about oh, 50 to go. I have about 50 more to go, but those are going to come off too. I've made some incredible friends that I just dearly love. And we've uh, started another business. I got out of that other deal. It was I'd get the money over five years if I stayed and helped manage. And I just said, the money's not important. And I left some, a lot of money on the table and uh, started another business. And we've, we're making more money with three people than we did with 15, which I like. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Life and management there, absolutely. boy. Absolutely. <laughs> and not only in the process have we, we always made a lot of money, but we never made it stick. And last year we invested over $50,000 thanks to Tony's tip, uh, techniques. So, and our relationship was always great, but I have to tell you this week, it's gone to a new level. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. It all started with a taste. Thank you, Tony. I noticed Bill took a bow when you said that. <laughs> you know, it's easy sometimes, you know, when you're around something so much, to take a little bit of it for granted, especially yourself, and how much progress you've made. It's kind of like your children, you know. People come to me and say, boy, Josh has sure grown. I go, yeah, he sure has, sort of, you know. But now that my son's in Switzerland going to school, he comes back three months later and goes, he's a giant, you know, because I have some contrast. I'm not around it as it's growing incrementally. I get to see the full impact. So you might want to think about a little bit today, and those of you on tape, how far have you really come? Even though you may have some challenges in your life, how far have you come? And most of you are doing so much better than you give yourself credit for, and most of you here are starting to give yourself a bit more credit, I notice, because you're smiling a lot more. Now, so today is life management systems. Question, what does everybody want? If we're going to manage things, we've got to manage them to get a result. So what does everybody want? Tell me. They want peace? What do they want? Yes. Balance? Yes. A fulfilling journey. I would say that what most people want, if you listen to people in the 60s, they'd say to change the world. What was it in the 70s? To take care of me, right? This is if you believe the media anyway. The media that said in the 70s was the me generation. Everybody was into the narcissistic approach. In the 80s, what was it supposed to be? If you believe the generalization. Money, right? It got to become successful. And in the 90s, the new catchword is quality of life. But no one seems to be able to define it. Quality of life. Well, I have more free time. Well, how many of you in this room, and I'm sure you must know people, if not yourself, have had free time and not been happy? Anybody had that experience? So sometimes what happens is people achieve their goals, as she just got done saying, achieve your goals and you're still not fulfilled, you're still not happy. So if that happens, you don't have a quality of life. You know, everybody has the illusion that someday when I have more money, when, someday when I have more time, someday when I have a better home, someday when my family is finally grown up, my kids make it out of school, someday when I get my kids into school, someday when this happens, then I'll have a quality life. But quality life only comes from one thing, fulfillment. And those of you watching here a few days ago, if you were on tape five, you listened to the goal setting workshop. We all did a goal setting workshop yesterday intensely. By the way, was that valuable for you? Did you enjoy it? Yes. Okay. So goals are one thing though, but goals are a vehicle towards getting yourself to meet these six human needs that we talked about on tape number seven. This whole idea, the six human needs and how to make sure that whatever you're doing, you don't just do something that makes you feel good for the moment. You do something that makes you feel fulfilled long term. So if you and I are going to really have an extraordinary quality of life, how would we measure that? Would it be by cars, homes, a certain amount of financial success, uh, maybe doing well in your career? I have to tell you, I've had the privilege now of being with people from about 43 nations of the world. And throughout that time, I've worked with the most, quote, successful people in the world and those that are most challenged. 
And what I find is the common denominator of success or failure ultimately is fulfillment. There are a lot of people out there that have everything on their side and they're frustrated. And there are a lot of people that have every challenge you can imagine. They're excited about the passion of their life, trying to figure out how to make it work. I think ultimately a quality life is a life where you experience the emotions that you want on a regular basis. You know, I had the privilege of meeting Sir John Templeton and talking with him and interviewing him. And this is a gentleman who's made an amazing difference in the world. He's also been very successful in business. He's a billionaire, probably one of the most successful investors for the last 50 years around the world. And when you ask Sir John, what does it take to be, quote, wealthy? John turned to me and said, Tony, takes one thing, gratitude. I said, that's interesting. He said, yeah, because it doesn't matter how much money you have in your life or anything else. If you're not grateful, you're not rich. I think that's really true way beyond the money, right? It's about all the areas of our life. So ultimately, what I really hope that personal power will do for you by your taking advantage of these tools is show you how to live in a place where you feel the joy, the excitement, the passion, the love, the connection, all the emotions that you really want in life and spend a lot less time in that frustration or that overwhelm or resentment or anger or anything else that used to dominate maybe your life or people that you care about. Because think about it. If we don't manage the ultimate resource of our emotion, where does our life go? We can be brilliant. We can have great ideas, great desires, but we're not going to follow through. We're not going to go start a new business unless we can generate the emotion that gives us drive. We're certainly not going to be in a position where we stay close to the people around us. Have you ever, for example, been in a frustrated state of mind and then snapped at one of your children and had nothing to do with them whatsoever? Felt bad about it maybe afterwards? Or maybe you've been in a place where you misinterpreted someone's intent. You thought they had some secondary approach or gain of doing something with you, and they just really cared. But you're in such an angry state, you kind of filtered it wrong. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I've been guilty of both those things in the past. And I don't want to be guilty of it in the future. And there's a way to create change. Now, I'm assuming, first of all, that you already know two of those ways because you've already done those personal power tapes, right? You're not supposed to be watching this video unless you first do those tapes. But just in case you didn't, I'll give you a little review. Two skills that immediately change the quality of our life by changing our emotions. And by the way, out of our emotions come all of our behaviors. If you're on a roll, if you're in a peak state, if you're feeling passionate, you will follow through. On the other hand, if you're feeling passive and quiet and tired, you're not going to follow through. So the ability to change your state in a moment is the secret to not only peak performance, but a quality life. So how do we do that when we're constantly in a world where we're being interrupted? Like, we may hear some airplanes here. You might have to bear in mind with me, but I have to both manage our states here. But the way you do it is two ways. And by the way, I'll show you these two ways real quick, remind you. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to take you to Hawaii, and I'm going to have you sit in on one of my seminars, and I'm going to teach you a skill that will show you how to immediately increase your drive to do certain things. For example, are there some things you know you need to do, but you have a hard time getting yourself to follow through? Or maybe there's some things that you want to do too much, like you want to eat that pizza, you want to have that chocolate, you want to do something that's kind of destructive, and you need to lower the amount of drive, lower the urge to follow through. I'm going to teach you a really valuable urge management tool that's so simple you can use it immediately. But first, let's do a quick recap, okay? Number one, whether or not we're happy or not, the way we feel determines the way we behave. So for example, can you remember a time in your life when you're really on a roll, where things were just flowing, where it's like it was effortless, where it's just like you didn't even have to think about it. Just you thought afterwards, how the heck did I do that? I'm sure you have. Have you also had times in your life, though, when you couldn't remember your own home telephone number or how to spell the word the, but it felt like you could do nothing right? And what's the difference in performance? You're the same person. You have the same ability or skill. But in one situation, you perform brilliantly, the other one kind of brutally. The difference in people's behavior is not their ability in most cases. It's the state that your mind and body is in at that moment in time. So how do we change our state if we're feeling frustrated or we're feeling depressed? Well, first of all, we have to learn and pay attention to what we naturally do when we're in a peak state versus what we naturally do when we're in an unhappy state. And by the way, you can use this to change performance immediately. I've done it with top athletes. Some of you saw on the infomercial Andre Agassi. Now, a whole series of athletes I've done this with where I'll help them discover when they're at their best, they just flow. They don't think about how am I going to hit that ball. I asked Andre when I first met him, I said, listen, have you ever hit a tennis ball perfectly? And he said, well, of course. I said, well, then stop trying to figure out how to change your swing, and let's get you back in that same state of mind where you naturally do this. Let's find out what the triggers were. And the first place we looked is step number one. To change your emotion, you must change the way you use what we call your physiology. That's a big word, but physiology just means the way you move, the way you breathe, the way you use your facial expression. I got some sun here. I'm squinting. It changes my state. <laughs> but the way you move affects everything. 
So for example, if a person's feeling depressed, do they take on a certain physiology, a certain posture, a certain breathing pattern? I mean, think about it honestly. What's the posture of somebody who's depressed? Where are their shoulders? Come on, tell me the answer. I want you to think of it yourself before I say it. Good, shoulders are down. Where's their head? Of course, down. What's their breathing like, full or shallow? Of course, shallow. Facial expression, is it up and tight or slack? We both know it's slack. Now, how come you knew this before I said it? Because you've practiced this stuff before, haven't you? We've all been in that place where we're depressed and we're down. And what's interesting is, how do we treat that? What do we do with that? Well, what most people will do is they go take a drug. Or if people are really feeling down in life, they'll go drink some alcohol or maybe smoke a cigarette. Some people do something positive like exercise, which gets you to engage your body in a strong way, which, by the way, immediately changes your state. So what we might do is just try something simple. Might try just breathing differently. Might try standing up differently. For example, try it with something simple. Right now in your chair, one of the challenges I have as you're sitting watching Fiji and some of this material we're sharing is you're not in a seminar. In a seminar, I help you keep yourself in a peak state. Because the state of mind you're in determines how much emotion you're feeling, and the emotion attached to the information is what gets you to follow through. So right now, you're kind of passive. So right now, do me a favor and do you one too. Try this. If you were feeling kind of tired and bored right now, how would you be sitting? Hopefully not how you are right now listening to me. <laughs> but how would you be sitting if you're bored and tired? Just try it. Come on, it's easy. Bored and tired. What, what happens to your shoulders? What happens to your body? What happens to your breathing? Bored and tired. A little frustration, that bored, tired, and frustrated. Right? Get that look on your face. Kind of right now, come on, try it. Just see what it's like in your body. See if there's actually a posture that goes with that emotion, a way of breathing, a facial expression. I think you know where it is. And if you went there real quick, that might be a sign you might want to change for the future. Now, in that state of frustration, imagine trying to design your life, trying to change your life. It's not going to happen. So now try this. Sit up in your chair right now. Come on. No one's watching. It's just you and this videotape with me. Come on. <laughs> Sit up in your chair. Come on, sit up tall. Sit up like you'd be if you were really feeling unstoppable right now. Has there been a time in your life when you felt like you were on a roll? Like, man, nothing you tried would be stopped. If you'd find a way to turn it around, sit up in your chair that way. Breathe the way you'd be breathing if right now you felt really good. Put the kind of smile on your face like you feel really excited. Now, I know this sounds third grade. Oh, yeah, what a pump up. Sit up, and that's going to really change my life. But the truth is, if you look at your life and you were to write down all the emotions you experience in the week, both good and bad, each of those emotions has tied to it a certain way of using your body. And if you keep using your body that way over and over again, you'll keep feeling that way. So make yourself breathe and feel good. Sit up like you are ready to make something happen right now. If you're in a state of certainty you were going to achieve what you wanted, how would you be sitting up? What would be the look on your face if you were totally determined right now? Make a little gesture. What kind of gesture would you make if you felt determined right now? Come on, just try it. And if you make that gesture really strong like you make it, mean it, how does it feel? Just kind of feel what that feels like in your body. In this state of mind, are you likely to do things differently than when you're in that passive state? You and I both know the answer to that question. But the secret is to train yourself to stay in this state so it becomes natural. It's kind of like, how do you build a muscle? I want to build a strong bicep, I may lift weights. And when I lift weights, I don't just exercise. If I want this muscle to grow, I've got to condition it by pushing beyond what I'm comfortable with. So if you're just watching me right now and going, who is this idiot telling me to do all this stuff? It's okay, but it won't give you a change. So you've got to really exercise it, and you've got to do something you're not comfortable with. And if I'm doing 10 curls with a weight, which one of those 10 do you think I want to do the least? Obviously, number 10. Which one will give me the most growth? Number 11. Right? When you push beyond your comfort zone, that's when you need to create a change for yourself. So now, what we're hearing in the background is another airplane. This tends to change our state because it affects state number two which I'll wait for it to go by for. The second thing that affects our state is what we focus on. What you and I focus on, moment to moment, radically changes the way we feel. So as that thing goes by, if you focus on the sound of the plane, which would be the natural thing to do, it's going to change your state. But I'll give you a better example. If you're in a position where you want to condition yourself to feel good, you've got to control what you consistently focus on and how you consistently use your body. So for example, if you wanted to feel bad right now, I bet you could pull it off. Do you have any memories from your past, some horrible memory that if you thought about it in detail and really focused on it, you'd feel really lousy all over again? You got an experience like that? Some people say, heck, I got zillions of them. I got a menu of experiences. Other people tell me, why go back to my past? My present is crappy enough. <laughs> some people are not satisfied with that. They think of things that haven't even happened yet, and they focus on them. Horrible things that haven't even occurred and feel bad about them in advance. You don't want to fall into that trap. So both of these become habits, by the way. People come to me all the time and they say, I don't know what it is, I just, I don't know what it is, Mr. Robbins, I just, I just, I just feel down all the time. Why do you think I feel so down? <laughs> so, 
Well, part of it is, look at their body. Part of it is what do they constantly focus on, how things haven't worked out, how they can't turn it around, and their body's in a lousy place. It's pretty obvious. Other people say, I don't know what it is. I feel so up all the time. What do you think is I feel so up all the time? <laughs> and it's pretty obvious. But we forget the fundamentals, don't we? We turn most of us, we don't like the way we feel, to alcohol again, or cigarettes, or smoking, or sleeping, or we go watch TV to change our focus, to take us off what we're focusing on that makes us feel bad, and make us on focus on something else that maybe feels OK for the moment. Or you go shopping, or you change the way you're moving, you feel pretty good, and you focus on something else. But none of those give you a long-term benefit. In fact, some of them have some negative side effects. So would it be nice to be able to change your state that fast, just by a radical change the way you use your body, or by a quick change in focus? And by the way, people come to me all the time and say, I don't know what it is, Mr. Robbins, but I'm really angry all the time. <laughs> they make these horrible looks on their faces. And I say, well, maybe we should start with your face. Because we get in a habit of using our body in a certain way, and that's it. It takes off and starts to control us. And you want to break out of that. In fact, there's research that's done now with monkeys that I personally don't support. But you should be aware of it. They'll take a monkey, tape down four of his fingers. Then they'll take one finger, and they'll manually bend it back and forth, over and over again, manually. After doing this for thousands and thousands of time, an interesting thing occurs. Each time you bend this finger of the monkey, metaphorically, imagine that to do this, the monkey has to make connection in the brain between one nerve cell, a neuron, and another, just as a metaphor. And imagine for this to happen, you have to draw a string of connection between those two neurons, those two nerve cells in the brain. Well, once you got one string, two, you got two. Thousands of times, the monkey is now wired to do this. So much so that now you can open the monkey's fingers and guess what the monkey does for no good reason? Over and over again. You go, so what? I'm not a monkey. What's the point? <laughs> well, the point is this. Do you ever go to work the same way each day? Maybe get on the same on-ramp each day? Do you have a kind of a ritual like that? Have you ever had a day where you're actually supposed to go in a different direction, but you're not thinking or on your cellular phone? And what do you do? You get right on that on-ramp the same way? You're a monkey. <laughs> what you're doing is you've conditioned yourself so much that it's like hypnosis. You just automatically go into it. Well, can we condition ourselves to feel frustrated over and over again by going into that same physiology, that same set of movements? You bet. Can you condition yourself to feel depressed? You bet. Can you also condition yourself to feel absolutely euphoric, where that is your natural emotional pump? And I'm not talking about just being motivated. I'm talking about really, truly feeling that way day to day, where the natural feeling for you is to be strong and to be focused and to be determined and to be happy. The answer is absolutely. Now, that's one aspect is physiology. Let's look at focus a little bit. You might say, okay, Tony. I know I've got to focus on what works. Are you saying just be a positive thinker? I don't believe in positive thinking. I don't believe in going to your garden and saying, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. That's not going to, don't take your garden. That's not going to help you. You've got to be able to focus on how it really is, but not make it worse than it is. You then got to see it how you want it. And then you got to focus on how am I going to make it the way I want it. And I'll tell you how you control your focus. It's not through affirmations, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. I'm really happy, I really am. <laughs> With that physiology, no matter what you say, you're not going to feel happy. But what it really is, is coming down to asking yourself better questions. You see, every moment while you're listening to me right now, every moment in your life, you're, quote, thinking. Thinking is nothing but the process of asking and answering questions. Here's the problem. Most of us ask questions unconsciously. And ask and you shall what? Receive. So if you ask lousy questions like, why does this always happen to me? Well, it may not always happen to you, but your brain is like the ultimate computer. If you ask it a question, it's got to come up with an answer. It's got to make one up. So if you say, why does this always happen to me? Your brain goes, you're a schmuck. Or some people say things like, how come I can never lose weight? And your brain goes, because you're a pig. <laughs> you ask a lousy question, what are you going to get? A lousy answer. A better question might be, how could I lose weight now and enjoy the process? Because if you say, how can I lose weight now? Your brain will just go on, go on a diet. And you go, I don't want to go through that again. But if you say, how can I lose weight now and enjoy the process? Your focus goes to not only achieving, but enjoying the process, you might say, you know, I've always wanted to ride horses. Maybe I'll take horseback riding lessons. I don't want to be thinking about it. I'll also lose weight. Do you get the idea of what I'm talking about? I'm doing it quickly because in Personal Power we've talked about these, but I want to remind you of them because the questions you ask yourself and the way you move radically changes the way you feel. The way you feel determines what you're going to do. In a frustrated state, you're not going to go out and be totally loving. In a frustrated state, you're not going to go start a business. Remember, it's not our intellect that makes us do these things. We don't marry someone because we made an intellectual list. You marry them because they ran off with your heart and you're passionate to be with this person. You love them. You start a business because you found some drive inside of you. Because it's hard to do those things. But the rewards are in who we become as a person as we live in these states. And they are habits. So you might want to take my little test. You might want to take a few minutes, stop this videotape, 
and actually write down a list of all the emotions you experience in a week. I mean, both the good and the bad, honestly. Right? What, what are the terrible feelings? What are the not so good feelings that you not feel once in a while, but consistently feel? What are the great ones? And again, test this. And I think what you're going to find is you've got probably less than a dozen emotions you experience consistently. And as a result of that, what's happening is at least half of them make you feel like heck. And as a result of that, what's happening? You should feel a smidge cranky when you see this because you're ripping yourself off. There are 3,800 emotions you could feel. So quality life is a life of powerful, positive emotion that you're able to share with the people around you, whether it be your kids or anybody else, because you're feeling it, not because you're pumped up, not because you're trying to make be positive or give something to someone else, because you really feel that way. And if you got everything else in the world, you got the money and the homes and the cars, and you got success, and everybody respects you, and you've changed the world, but you're not happy, then you got a John Belushi on your hands. A guy that tons of people love, did what he loved in his life, and he's gone because he didn't make himself feel good. He made everybody else feel good. Or an Elvis Presley. Or maybe your neighbor. Or maybe you and your past. It certainly was my past. So I really want you to take a look at this. Let me offer you one other little tool, and then I'll take you to Hawaii. It's a simple little thing. So simple. I'm a big believer in profound knowledge. Profound knowledge to me is something that is so powerful, but it's so simple. It's something that as soon as you understand it, whether it be a strategy or an idea or a distinction, that the minute you understand it, you can immediately change the quality of your life as well as anybody else's life that you have the privilege to actually touch. So here's a simple idea. I call it incantations. We all know about self-talk. You know, you should talk to yourself right. But you can self-talk yourself like crazy. You're great, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great, and still feel like heck. So that doesn't do it. We know about affirmations. I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. The difference between an affirmation and what I want to talk to you about is something I call incantations. The literal dictionary definition of incantations is magical words spoken forth. Now, when you speak magical words, they have an impact on you. What's the magic that takes a word into something that actually changes our life? Well, repeating it over and over again is OK, but it's emotion. I mean, think about it. That's what starts wars. That's what makes you fall in love. That's what changes your life is emotion. So we have certain phrases that we say to ourselves a lot, over and over again. But when we say them and add emotion, they literally put us in a form of almost hypnosis, kind of like incantation. Think about the times of King Arthur and uh, the spells that used to be put on people to turn them from a frog into a prince or vice versa. Well, we use these incantations all the time. People say to me things like, you know, uh, you ask somebody, could, could you go get me the salt? In their head, they're on the way in going, I don't know where the salt is. I really don't know where it is. It, it's right over there to the right. I don't know where it is. You keep saying, I just don't know where it is. You open the cupboard, you really look, you keep saying, I don't know. And finally say, I can't find the salt, amazingly. So person comes in, they walk right next to you, reach right in front of your face, and they go, what is this? You go, the salt. Have you ever had an experience like this, honestly? Well, the salt was right in front of your face. Did you see it? Yes. How come you didn't perceive it? because you'd literally given yourself in psychology what we call a scotoma, a blind spot. You'd hypnotize yourself into literally not seeing it. Now, we do this with our lives all the time. People say, you know, I just can't do this. I, I just can't get myself to follow through. I can't get myself to follow through. I just can't. Why do you think I can't get myself to follow through? <laughs> well, it might have to do with what you say 20 times a day with all the emotional intensity you can possibly generate that's creating this challenge. You got to notice that. Or, I love chocolate. I, love, I just love it so much I can never give it up. Now, teach me how to give it up. Well, nothing's going to change you if you keep giving your brain and your body a direct command through incantations. And by the way, you can use incantations to enhance your life. What if when you were running, you were saying, I'm a lean, mean, running machine? Or every day and every way I'm getting better and better. An old affirmation from an old book from years ago that most of us know, but do you use it? See, my whole thing in life is so much stuff that makes a difference in life is simple. We know it. But the difference in life is knowing doesn't change your life. Doing does. Lots of people know what to do, but they don't do what they know. So what I want to do right now is have you just think about, put yourself in a strong state. Sit up in your chair. Don't be sitting passively anymore in here, because that's the challenge. You're not in my seminar. My seminar, I'd move you. Because the last part of emotion, I should mention, is conditioning. Just like those monkeys, what makes them go is repetition. Here's what they found out when they did this training of their fingers. If they take down all the fingers and they move this finger, but while they're doing it, they create a tremendous amount of emotion in the animal. And the way they do that is they stimulate the pleasure center of the brain in this monkey while this is happening, pleasure, while it's happening, pleasure, while it's happening. Pretty soon, guess what? It doesn't take thousands of times, a dozen or two times, and the monkey does this constantly. Advertisers know this. How the heck do you think they run all these commercials? Commercials have very little to do with what the product really is. In a beer commercial, do you get reality? 
Do you get a big guy with a nice beer belly grabbing his buddy by the head, pound him, going, eh, love you, little buddy? I don't think so. What you get instead is some really sexy, attractive woman or man who's drinking this beer looking wonderful, as if that had anything to do with the beer. See, the reality is it all comes down to attaching emotion to what it is you want. Every advertiser knows that. What you want to learn to do is advertise in your own brain to condition yourself to follow through. And the first way to do that is right now be in an upstate. And by the way, if you see some video of our university, you see people having a great time, look like they're at a rock and roll concert or at a top sporting event or they're celebrating, it's not about pump up. It's about putting yourself in the state where you will learn and remember. That's what it's really about. So here's the tool I want you to learn, really simple. We're going to show you a tool I call an urge management tool. It'll show you how to take something, for example, that you don't want to do and get yourself to love doing it, really love doing it. I'll also show you a tool if there's something you love to do that's not good for you, how to change it. And it's all done with some simple questions. So let's go to Hawaii and let's give you a little idea what it looks like and then I'll demonstrate it for you with a real person and I think you'll laugh and, and hopefully learn as well. I'll see you in a few moments. To give you one other little tool and it's a t tool that is so simple again it's like my idea of profound knowledge is when you take something complex and you figure out how to make it so simple anybody can do it you can even use it immediately it's easy and it produces a result now i'll tell you what the tool is it's about how to change the quality of any experience you have in a matter of seconds any experience love making a business situation a meal exercise, anything. And the tool I, I'm going to talk to you about is called the Quality Quantifier. And what it really is about is how to increase the quality of any experience you have. I developed this tool because people have used like the personal power product, for example, around the world and made major changes in their weight. For example, how many of you use that product to lose some weight? Let me see your hands. Now, do people overeat every moment they're alive? Yes or no? They only eat when they're in overeating what? State. When you get in that state, you lose all your consciousness about what to eat, about how to eat, about how much to eat. It's gone because you're in a state of such urgency. And when people are trying to make their life better, they have to be able to do it by being conscious. But what happens when the urgency rises, your consciousness disappears, and all of a sudden you lose all of your faculties. So I started thinking, have I ever been in a state where I felt like I had to eat? But then something broke the pattern. And I forgot about it for a while. How many of you had that experience? You thought you were starved, something broke your pattern, and you lost the urge. It's not that you can't manage your behavior, it's that you're not managing your urges. Because if in the moment of the urges you took something to take control of it, you could have changed it all. So in order to do that, I was at a friend's house, and I was thinking, okay, how do I help people manage those urges? There's so many tools. I want to create something so simple anybody can do it. And I thought, there's certain levels of urges. They have different levels. Some urges. You feel driven. Some urges you feel like no matter what, you're going to have it right now. Like how many of you have ever broken some of your own health rules because you got in such an urge state? Okay? But other times, like you could have that food you think you're normally addicted to. It's sitting there in front of you and you don't even care. Have you had that experience too? And not because you were full, just because you weren't into it. So I said, well, let's quantify that. There's a quality of experience. There's a quality of our state where we follow through where we follow through a little, where we don't follow through at all, and where literally no one can make us follow through, make us eat it. And I've, everyone has this capability. It's all a matter of manipulating our focus, our perception, the meaning we attach to things. So I was at this friend's house, and he had some banana bread sitting on their uh, coffee table. And I looked at the banana bread, and I asked this lady there who I know, I said, what's your level of desire for that banana bread right now on a scale from 0 to 10? She looked at it and went, Maybe a four. I said, well, what would it take to make it a seven? She said, what do you mean? I said, to make it where, right now four, whatever that is, you've now quantified where you are. What would it take to have the desire move up to seven? Not ten, but seven. Well, you really start to really want it. She said, well, I thought about it being hot. I said, what about eight? So if I thought it was hot and it just come out of like the oven, I thought about its smells, and I, I could actually feel the chewiness in my mouth. And you can see her start to go into state. Her eyes got like this, start doing the banana. She's looking at the banana bread like this. She's going to swoop in for it. Now, right? I said, what would it take it to 10? She goes, if you put chocolate on it. 
<laughs> I said, okay, well, well, hold back. <laughs> I said, what was it take for you to get it to two? She said, to realize it's just cold and been sitting there for a while. And you could see her just drop down to it. So it's like a scale, right? I said, okay, what would it take for you to get to minus two? And she said, I couldn't do that. I mean, I like it. I said, I know you can't, but if you could do it. Whenever people say they can't do something, say, I know you can't, but if you could, they'll give me the answer. If you're persistent. She goes, I guess if I looked at the grease on the napkin it's sitting on. And I thought about that going in and, oh, oh, then I wouldn't want it at all. You could just see her whole state change. I said, what would it take to make it minus five? She said, if I saw all that grease, like, crumpled together, like coming out my pores, like acne or something. Ugh. I said, what would it take for it to be minus 10? She goes, oh, my God, if I thought it was going to make me sick. She goes, if I thought it make me sick, I'd throw up. Or, oh, my God, I never do it. I said, what would I be? Oh, ah. And she started getting this really state. I said, you want it? She goes, no, I don't want it. I said, well, come back here for a second. Imagine it being hot and moist and chewy. And she went, oh, yeah. <laughs> I imagine chocolate on chocolate on it. <laughs> so no, no, come back over here. It's really cold. See, it's cold. See that? And literally, I could just move her up and down the scale emergency. So I'm watching this, and I'm saying, wow, this is amazing. Being able to shift back and forth. And by the way, people usually, to get to minus 10, also have fear of loss. It's that they be sick, or they lose their freedom, or it would do something to them that's horrible, some form of pain. Pain, the loss of pain, the fear of loss, that pain, seems to push people through the low roof for urgency. Like when you say, oh my God, I haven't eaten in 12 hours. That'll move you up there real fast. Like, I'm starved. At the same time, you think something's going to make you sick, you'll avoid it at all costs. It becomes that other level. So I started saying, we all have the resources inside to change where we are on the scale from one place to the other. But then I started using this thing, thinking, wow, I could do this beyond food. Most people in life have experiences where they go out and do something and see how it turns out. How silly. How stupid. So I was here in Hawaii for a program a couple years ago, and a good buddy of mine, we run together. We went out on a run, and it was a really hot day, and we were on the big island that year. And the place we ran was like where all the volcanoes have just desolate, you know, created, made it desolate. There's no trees or nothing. And it was really, really hot, and there was no wind. So we went on this run, and we were just pushing it pretty good. And we came back at the end of the run, and I said, let me ask you a question. I said, how would you rate that run we just did on a scale from minus 10, worst thing in our whole lives, to plus 10, the best run ever? He said, I'd say it's like a six or a seven. I said, that's exactly where I rated my head, too. I said, let me ask you a question. If you and I were going to go back and run again, is there anything we could have done that would have made it, if we decided it was going to be a level eight run, could we have done that? If we decided in advance it'd be a level eight run, could we have done it? He said, yeah. I said, what conditions would we have to create in our head, or our bodies, what would he have to do to make that a level eight run for you? He said, if we would have run like in unison as we run it, you know, because sometimes you went ahead and I went ahead and we went back kind of back and forth and, and sometimes we're going back here and there, you know, and sometimes we're teasing each other. But if we were running in unison, so that would just, that'd be an eight for me. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. I've never thought of that. Yeah. I said, what would have made it a nine for you? He said, a nine. He said, if we'd been running in unison and we were running like doing a cadence or something, like saying something, was doing it in unison. He said, it would just be, that would be awesome. You guys had a military background. Cadence. And I said, well, what would have made it a 10? He said, we've been running our guts out, right? I mean, well, we couldn't even breathe. We're at the end of it. We've been in unison. We've been cranking. And we just collapsed from total intensity and exhaustion. And I said, you know what? I said, I now know why you're always getting injured. Because he's always getting injured when he's exercising. Because the only way for you to have a level 10 experience is to push yourself beyond what is helpful and be totally anaerobic. And he went, oh, whoa. You're totally right. So I want to have a great experience. My complex equivalent in my head of a great experience is so exhausted and I'm nothing left. I said, so I've discovered in my life there are lots of ways to have a level 10 experience. There isn't just one way. So how can we have a level 10 experience but not be burned to the ground? He said, wow. Thoughtful. Well, I said, well, if while we were running, we would have like noticed, you know, the water in the distance and noticed the different shapes of the lava. If we would have, as we're running, looked back at each other and smiled a few times while we were in unison, if we would have brought like a piece of music for the last part of the run that we could have turned on and we could have cranked to and felt really good to but not been exhausted, we came up with all these things and we made a level 10 run. So what I do now in life is when I'm going to have an experience, I ask myself, what's the quality of experience I'm committed to having? I don't wait and hope it shows up. Does that make sense? Because if you wait and see, you get what shows up. 
You decide in advance what the outcome, and the way you do that is you give a numerical number to it to start with. You say, where am I right now about doing this run? You might wake up and go, I'm at level four about doing this run. What do I want this run to be? And you may not want it to be a 10, but you probably want it to be in the eight, nine, 10, seven, eight, nine, 10 range. You say, okay, I want it to be at least a level eight. Then you ask yourself, what conditions would I have to create in myself or in the environment? What would I need to do to meet more of my six human needs? In essence, does that make sense? So what would I have to do? What would I have to notice? What would I have to appreciate? What would I have to do with myself? What would I have to think? What would I have to focus on in order for this to be a higher level experience for me? And what happens is you then set yourself up for victory. And I came back after this run. I was so juiced. because like I said, now I can have a great run whenever I want. I can just decide to, figure out the conditions, make it happen. I, it's, we all have this illusion that life makes us feel a certain way rather than we create the conditions within ourselves that generate our life. So false. So what you want to do is see where are you, step one, zero to ten. Step two, how do you want to feel? Describe some of those feelings. Step three, give it a numerical number. It's going to be a level eight experience or nine or whatever. Step four, what are the conditions that I can control? Not I'll be happy if you do everything I want and then go do that. Now I'll give you an example of this also. At the same time I was there, I shared this with a group about my run with my buddy. And this one man raised his hand, he said, but running for me is a minus 10 experience. I said, why? He says, because I'll die of a heart attack. I said, have you died in a heart attack in the past? Is that how you know? He said, no, but I, I was running one time. My heart started beating out of me. I said, well, how long ago was that? He said, it was 10 years ago. And I said, well, are you in better shape, worse shape? What does your doctor say? He said, oh, my doctor says I'm in really, really great shape, but I can never run again because I know what that means. I said, well, great. Tell me what it means. And so he told me what it was at minus 10. I said, what if it was only minus three? I didn't go to plus 10. That's too big a jump. Do you follow me? One of the big things is you go, I'm going to have a level 10 experience, and you don't even know how to do a four yet. So you've got to go from, like, wherever you are at one or two and go to four, and then go to six, and then go to eight, and move your way up. I didn't take him to 10. I said, now, as long as you know you're healthy and you're running in a way that does not tax your heart, you're being totally aerobic, you're going to walk if necessary, you're wearing a heart monitor the whole time, I said, could you do that? He said, yes. He was looking forward to it. He came back the next day. I said, what was your level of run? He said, i got to tell you, it didn't work. Everybody looked, and he said, I had a level 16 run. So I want to show you how to do this in a kind of a fun way. Let's take pizza. I think that'll be an easy example, a fun example. Who here is absolutely, totally, completely addicted to pizza? You could swallow two or three of them right now. You're so, you, I mean, nothing can stop you from pizza. That's how much you want it. A total addiction to pizza. If you have that addiction, stand up so I can see it. All right, hold it. All right, how about, how about this gentleman right here? Come on down, sir. Give him a hand. Come on down. This is Bill. Give him a hand. It's Bill. First point is you've got to recognize where you are currently about the, the task at hand, whether it's running, whether it's pizza, anything. So you're going to assign a numeric value to your experience. You're going to say on a scale from minus 10 to what? Plus 10, where are you? So we'll say to you, on a scale, Bill, from minus 10 to plus 10, where are you around eating pizza? Plus 10. Plus 10. Is it just plus 10 or is it above plus 10? Plus 12. Plus 12. Is that about accurate? Yeah. Plus 12. Okay? So then... Most people never decide in advance the level of quality, pleasure, joy, excitement, or even pain that they're committed to experiencing to a given task in advance. So the second step is to consciously describe what feelings you want to experience while doing a particular activity. The third step is to decide and quantify. You say, I'm going to give it this quality, I'm going to make it a level 10 experience, 9, whatever. The fourth step to the right here is you're going to ask yourself the question, what conditions must I create inside myself or the environment in order to experience this at a level of quality at level whatever? Okay? What do I need to focus on, appreciate, what do I need to do with the task in order to change how I feel about it? What we'll do here with Bill is we will ask him where he is, and we'll get him to move things for us and tell us what he has to do to change it on the scale. So, Bill, if you imagine this is our scale from minus 10 to plus 12. We'll have to add two more here for Bill. Okay? So, plus 12. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put his feet in front of him, and he'll describe for us a little bit what are some of the qualities that he needs. So, Bill, here is a pizza, sausage pizza. Well, first off, I don't eat sausage or pepperoni. You don't eat sausage or pepperoni? I love the, the cheese and, and the other aspects of pizza. Cheese pizza. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
that you know there's a desire for this pizza. <laughs> right now it's only a 10. It's only a 10. It's only a 10. Okay. Not really, it's not really warm. It's not really warm. Well, imagine it warm. 10. 10. Imagine it getting warmer. <laughs> imagine, can imagine some mushrooms on it. Okay, imagine some mushrooms on it. Maybe a 12. The 12. So imagine it with mushrooms on it, warm. Mm -hmm. Some dried tomatoes. Some dried tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Dried tomatoes, mushrooms, cheese, yeah. melted cheese. Like, <laughs> 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 Dripping with cheese? Dripping with cheese. Dripping with cheese. Extra cheese. What kind of cheese? Extra cheese. Extra cheese. <laughs> What's your level of desire at that level now? My, About 15. <laughs> About 15. Okay, so extra cheese. Does that help him get in that state? Well, let's write down. What does he do to get it higher? Write it down in your little sheet here. To get even higher, what does he do? He adds in his mind that it's really hot. He adds in his mind that it's got mushrooms. And to get to 15, he puts on extra what? Cheese. Look at his face when he even says it. Look at his face. Cheese. And sun-dried tomatoes. Thank you. Now, think about this pizza now. And I want you to take this pizza, if you would, and put it down, if you would, to level 8. Go ahead and hold it with the other hand. Level 8. Tell me, what do you got to do to make it level 8? Um... Okay. It's not really, it wouldn't be warm. It'd be warm. And um, maybe it's just cheese pizza or... Oh, yeah. I gotta give you, the, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong one, didn't I? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, if it wasn't really warm, if it was just slightly above room temperature, maybe it'd be an eight. Slightly above room temperature, which is about what that one is. Okay, it's up to me. Bring it down to a three. It did have pepperoni and sausage on it. Okay. Hold both of them It looks more attractive when he's got more. Did you see his face? Oh. <laughs> I still want to drop it. Okay, that's fine. No problem. So make it a three and it's got sausage on it because you don't eat sausage or pepperoni. Because after all, you're one of those guys that has a pizza and a light beer. Uh, I don't drink beer either. Oh, okay. You don't drink beer either. Do you have a soft drink? Diet Coke. <laughs> Before the seminar. Before, I, I, I understand. I'm not in your case. I'm your buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that what we all do? It's not just him. Yeah, give me a big extra cheese pizza and a light Coke. <laughs> okay, it's a sausage. Make it a zero. Where you should be noticing is not just what he says. Do you see the change in his head? Do you see the change in his breathing? Her, his facial expressions? Is he in the same state? Yes or no? Is he even close? Where is it now? Zero to ten. Zero. Zero. So zero is it's been sitting out for now. Make it minus three. Uh, it's pepperoni and sausage, and it's been sitting out for an hour, and the grease is kind of coming out of the meat. The grease is coming out of the meat. Can you picture that? Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. And what if it was a cheese pizza, but it's still minus three? And it had also mushrooms on it, and it also had extra cheese, but it's still minus three. And it even had... Tomatoes, sun-dried tomatoes, but it's minus three. How do you do that? It's been sitting out for a while. How long? A couple hours. How do you know when you look at it? Um, it's kind of glazed over. I guess the sugars come out from the cheese on top. It's kind of glazed over, maybe hard. Getting um, hard, the sugar is glazed over on top. Anything else that makes it a minus three? No uh, idea. Okay, make it a minus seven. I can smell the meat kind of rotting a little bit. Smell the meat rotting. Smell the meat rotting a little bit. Where is it now? Minus seven. Minus seven. It's at minus seven. Bring it down to minus nine. But it has no meat. It's minus nine. It has mushrooms. It has extra cheese. It has sun-dried tomatoes. And it's minus nine.
kind of fighting the urge because I'd be smelling the rancid smell of cheese in my stomach. Okay, go ahead and do that. Well, I don't want to throw up here. <laughs> but I mean, I, I would get that urge. You, you'll get the urge, but I won't let you throw up. <laughs> Tell us when you're at minus nine. You won't throw up till we put you at minus 11. <laughs> we won't take you that far. But you'll be real close. Where you are now? Minus minus eight. Minus eight. Take it to minus nine. What are you focusing on? Take it to minus nine. Uh, the smell. The smell of what? Like cheese ret rotting cheese. Rotting rancid cheese. Can you see what it looks like too? And smell it? I I, I couldn't even look at it. Can't even look at it. Go ahead and look at it while you say that. Look at it, think pizza. That's it, just look at it and think pizza. Tell me when you're at minus nine. Imagine mushrooms, extra cheese. Mushrooms, extra cheese, pizza. That's it, mushrooms, extra cheese, pizza. That's it, mushrooms, extra cheese, pizza. Where are you right now? Scale of zero to 10. Mushrooms, extra cheese, pizza, smelling the rancid smell. Look at the pizza when you think about it also. See it and smell it. That's it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. That's it, that's it. Mushroom extra cheese. Smell it. Smell the rancid smell. That's it. Smell the rancid smell. That's it. Smell it. Smell it. There it is. Smell the cheese. You can smell it. That's it. Smell the extra cheese. That's it. Smell it. Extra cheese. I'd like some extra rancid cheese. Where are you? Zero to ten, right? Minus ten right now. Where are you? Minus nine, minus ten. Don't go to minus eleven. Don't go to minus eleven. Okay. You want some? No, I don't want it. <laughs> so does that look like a fun and hopefully valuable tool? I know it's deceivingly simple, so you might say, well, you know, I don't know if that's really going to change the way I really feel, or maybe it'll change the way I feel for the moment, but it's not going to last. In fact, Lisa Gibbons, who was the person who interviewed me in the infomercial that you saw before you got these tapes, she was at that program. And afterwards, she came up to me and she said, you know, how did you know he was going to change so fast? I said, because everybody does. We all have the same nervous system. And when we use it effectively, it's like a computer. When you know the right code, you can change it rapidly. It's this hypnosis we have that change has to take forever. It has to be painful that keeps us from changing. And I said, also, I said, it'll last. Are you watch? She said, well, we'll see. So we just followed up about a year later with this gentleman, Bill. And what's interesting is, not only has he not touched any pizza for an entire year, I mean, not even close, but he said he's never touched any more cheese. And here's the best part. Is it because he can't? No, he could go back and change it tomorrow if he wants to. I'm not about taking away people's choices. But he doesn't have an urge to. He doesn't have any desire, is what he said. I just don't want it. Wouldn't it be nice to eliminate one of your addictions through this simple process? Now, it's true if you are, like, say, loving chocolate, and you keep saying, I love chocolate, I just love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, and you give yourself this incantation, remember that? Or with all this emotional intensity, you talk about how much you love it all the time, and then you go to do this to change, highly unlikely it's going to last because you're going to be giving your brain a different message. So you have to make sure that you control your internal dialogue by creating a new incantation that supports you, and you have to make this adjustment. So I want you now to do this so you see that it really works. You can do it with food, you can do it with something that you're doing right now that's not so good, and figure out, okay, if right now my level of desire for this food is at a nine, and I don't want to eat this food or this alcohol or this whatever, how would I lower it? And don't try and go from nine to zero. It might be too big a jump. I'll say, well, what would it take for me to only like it enough that I consider it on a zero to 10 scale to be a seven or a six? And really think about it. And by the way, the state you're in when you're asking these questions makes a big difference. If you're sitting passively going, well, what would it take for me to feel like a seven? Your brain won't have the answer. You've got to ask a question where well, you're telling your brain, I expect the answer. You've got to have certainty when you ask a question that you're going to get the answer. If you don't have certainty, it won't work. So put yourself in a peak state and then say, okay, now what would it take for me to have this be like a three, a zero? And write it down, and you'll find a little chart that's enclosed with this videotape that can help you track it. What about a minus two? What about a minus six? And what you'll find is exactly how to increase your desire, or decrease your desire, I should say, or increase it if you want to. And by the way, what is this really about? 
quality of life. We talk about setting goals for quality of life. Here's what I want you to do. I want you not just set a goal for the quality of your life. I want you to decide and make it happen. And the way you do that is if I'm going to go on a run here on the beach, I don't want to just go for the run and see what shows up and whether I enjoy it or not. I want to decide in advance what the quality of that run is going to be for me. So if you want to take something that already feels okay or you're not inspired to do and you want to increase its intensity of enjoyment, you've got to say, okay, where am I right now about going on this run on the beach? Zero to ten. Well, I'm about a six and a half or seven. Okay, well, what would it take for me to be at an eight and a half? I don't know. As soon as you say, I don't know, say, I know I don't, but if I did, what would it be? Kind of change your state, you'll get the answer if you keep asking. So you're going to say, well, if I were to like notice what a beautiful day it is, well, what would bring it to a nine? Well, maybe if I brought some music with me, or if I listened to one of those Tony Robbins tapes, <laughs> or something better, right? Something to put you in a good state, so maybe I feel like I'm learning while I'm running. Well, maybe I could get it to a nine and a half by doing an incantation. As I'm running, I'm a lean, mean running machine. Or as I'm running, all I need is within me now. All I need is within me now. All I need is within me now, with tremendous energy and emotion, right? If you do that over and over again, how's that going to feel? You know? All I need is an airplane to go away so I can finish this tape. <laughs> Whatever it is, you want to be saying it again and again while you're running, so you're literally programming yourself. That might bring you to a nine and a half. Maybe you go run with a friend, that brings it to a 10. The point is really simple. Don't settle for whatever life gives you. You determine the quality of your life. And the way you do it is ask this question. If I'm at level seven now, what conditions? First of all, what's the level I want to have? Maybe you don't want a level 10 run. Maybe I want it to be a nine or an eight. What conditions must I create inside myself for that to be a level nine run? What conditions? What do I have to notice? What do I need to appreciate? What do I need to believe or experience in order to really do that? What, what do I need to add to the experience? What do I need to think about? What do I need to listen to? And if you ask that question, you'll get the answer. So I know I've dumped a lot on you in this tiny little tape and kind of jumped you all over the world here, but my goal here is really to get you to do the 30-day tapes. I'm not in this little videotape going to get you to fall through all these things, but those tapes will allow you to do a little bit each day where it's not invasive on your life. And if you'll just do the little exercise at the end of it for 30 days, I promise you, radical changes. There's a reason why there's 25 million of these tapes out there and so many people from every walk of life that have gotten results. Because it's a, it's a way of conditioning and creating lasting change. So please, go do those tapes. And if you're done, then I'm sure you've already got a great story to tell me. So when this tape's over, make sure you do this exercise. Don't say, well, that was kind of interesting. Stand up and do it. In fact, before I leave you, stand up. Come on, get up off the chair. Stand up just for a second. Come on, come on, stand up. And as you're standing up right now, try something real fast. Stand the way you stand when you're not sure what to do, when you're feeling kind of uncertain. In fact, if you want to try something right now, think about something that you'd like to have happen, a goal or desire. And right now, stand the way you stand when you hope it works out. Come on, try it. How do you stand when you hope? Where are your shoulders when you kind of hope so? Sure hope it works out. I hope this darn tape program makes a difference in my life. Sure hope so. You know? How do, how do your shoulders look? What's your breathing like when you're uncertain? You don't really know. Where's the weight in your body? Where do your hands tend to go? Say something in an uncertain tone. There's nobody around. It's just you and me on tape. Go ahead, try it. Yeah, I hope so. Hope, 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 hope. What does that feel like? Is your voice loud or quiet? Slow or fast? Shoulders, hands, where do they go? How does it feel about your ability right now to actually achieve this goal? Probably not very great. When you think about it, maybe you think about it working and also not working. Now try this. What if you were worried, what would you do? Try and be worried a second. What do you do? Maybe tense up a little bit? You get out of that. Put yourself in a state of certainty right now. How would you stand if you were absolutely determined that your goal would become a reality? If you were going to use this to truly change your life. Come on, if you're not standing up by now, please stand up. Right? Stand up. Feel strong. How do you stand when you are totally determined to make something happen? If you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, you have decided this will be and therefore it will be. If you didn't even know how you're going to do it, but you just decided you were going to find a way or make a way. Have you ever been in that place where you felt like you're in a role where you felt like that nothing was going to stop you? Even if you haven't, stand that way now. Who do you know who's unstoppable? Stand like that. Pick some movie character, an Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody. Somebody outrageous, somebody, and be in that state. Because remember, when you change your posture, when you change your breathing, most importantly, when you change the way you move, emotion is created by motion. The tempo at which you say something will change you. So right now out loud, in a state of certainty, say anything out loud about your goal. I will achieve it.
I will make this happen. Whatever you want to say, but try it right now. And that state of certainty, do it now. Come on. And that state of certainty, right now, feel how good that feels. And in that state, I'd like to ask you to take some action. And the action is do this exercise immediately. So either pick something you want to lower your emotion for or pick something you want to enjoy more and change it right now. When you go turn this off, take action. If you do, I'll know you'll have some nice results to tell me as well. And I hope, after you finish these 30-day tapes, you write me a personal note about what's happened in your life. That's what I do this for the most. That's what juices me. I'd love to hear the story of your success and your enjoyment. And also, I hope I get a chance to see you in person. I gave you a $100 discount to come to one of my seminars because I hope you'll come take advantage of that. It's nothing like being in the environment where you get personal live coaching to get something done. And if you join me at Master University, you won't just get mine, but you have people like Norman Schwarzkopf teaching you leadership and people like Peter Lynch who's taught in the past force finance and people like John Gray to show you how to make your relationships work. So if you're interested in that, please look in the back of your book or call us with a number at the end of the show. But I just want to say to you that I hope this is not the end but the beginning of our relationship, but regardless, what I wish for you the most is a quality of life that is extraordinary. And that's done by you deciding to make it that way and using the God-given talents that you and I already have. So create an extraordinary life, enjoy yourself, take care of yourself and your family, make a difference in the world, and most importantly, live with passion. God bless. I hope to see you soon. I got a little taste of this. I'm hungry. Bring me some cookies. My wife's going to carry this around, and I'm carrying this around. Sometimes I'll say, well, since you're carrying that around anyway, put the wallet in it. If you competed with those folks, you knew they were great. You should have bought the hell out of that stuff. One of the problems I always have with Tony's groups is they never have any enthusiasm when I talk to them. You know, well, dear, I think you should do what you think is best. of our time perfect the life of your dreams anthony robbins mastery university